All right, so um, so I want to talk quickly about ODP 207. Just make sure everyone was was comfortable with that. Um, and then I mainly want to talk about PA2 and go through the description of it. And it's going to be very much what you've already seen with PA1, but I want to talk through that so that if you want to work on it over the next three days, you've you've seen everything that you need to know about doing that assignment. Um, and then I want to start looking at some code for manipulating this new type of node where we're actually pointing to memory. And we'll write some code and then we'll play with the structures we build up in GDB and hopefully get some, some practice and motivation for using GDB more. Um, so let me just start with um, the ODP that you already turned in. And there's no ODP due tomorrow or Sunday or Monday or Tuesday. So I'll post an ODP Tuesday morning for Wednesday. Um, so 207 was building this little list where we had two nodes and we wanted to link one to the other. Um, and, and it really is one line of code, right? That's really the whole action of it. Just take n1 arrow next and set it equal to n2. Um, the reason that this may not be as easy as it looks is because there's this issue of terminology or, or concept or something where we talk about n1 and it means two things. It means a pointer to the node, but sometimes it actually means the node itself. When we say n1 arrow next equals n2, um, we're acting as if this n2 is actually the node and we're pointing to it, right? But it's really the address of the node. And, and it ca is this confusing to anybody? Has it been confusing to anybody? The question of when we're pointing to something and when we're talking about the actual thing itself. So that, that confusion goes away the more you do this. And when we, when we hop into GDB, that will hopefully help. And as you're writing this stuff, it will, it will hopefully start to get clearer over time. And then at some point, you wake up one morning and it's like crystal clear. And it's like this has always been the case. So, um, but yeah, so in this case, just take n1 arrow next. That's the next field, that little block on the bottom of the node. And we store the value of n2, which is an address. So n2 is actually some location in memory. And when we put that into here, then if we s set something equal to n1 arrow next, that's a pointer. And we can dereference its fields with an arrow and so on. Yeah. Uh, I can, uh, I can uh, uh, after the n1 narrow nest equal n2, after that I, I can do, I could do uh, n2 narrow nest equal no. Yes, you could. Yeah. yeah. You weren't supposed to for the ODP, but yeah, you could. n2 is, is, is just another node. Yeah. Um, and in fact, you could also do things like um, n1 arrow next arrow next equals null. And that would do the same thing as n2 arrow next equals null because this is what we just set into n2. But you can change these, chain these things along however you like. You could do n1 arrow next arrow data. And whatever n1 is, This would load a 100 right into here. And if we had another node after this, we could say n1 arrow next, arrow next, arrow data. Now I'll put a 55 right here. Because n1 arrow next is this node and n1 arrow next arrow next is the next field of this node that's pointing right here and n1 next next data that's that field right there and we don't usually do stuff like this right we'd use a temporary variable we'd call this next and we'd call this second next or something but you can do this and it'll understand what you're trying to say and sometimes it's it's more meaningful to do this in one line. 
So we're going to play with that in a little bit. Let me talk about PA2. So the assignment is about 90% the same words from PA1. So you're implementing a linked list, but you're using dynamically allocated memory instead of an array. So your list is constructed from nodes. The node looks a little different. It's a data piece and then a pointer to a struct node. Um, and so next is actually memory location of the next element or null for the end of the list. And here we're not using my null anymore. We're just going to use null. So there's still a sentinel node. And in your main program, you can declare a struct node star, whatever you want to call the thing that gets you to your list, list or LL or, or whatever else your favorite name is. Um, and then you implement the following function. So your init function will look different from PA1's init function. Your init function here actually returns a pointer to a struct node. And that's different from PA1. The other functions have exactly the same prototype. So what does the init do? Um, It creates a sentinel node and returns its address. So it creates a single struct node. You can set the data to whatever magic number you like. You set the next field to null, and then you return the address of that sentinel node. And so in your main program, if you're deciding you're going to call your main list list, you could say list equals init, paren, paren, and that should initialize your empty list and then add print delete search exactly the same thing you take a struct node star you take a number to add um, a number to delete a number to search for and these are the main programs sole access to the linked list so anytime the main program wants to interact with the linked list, it does it through these five functions. The main program should never call malloc. It should never call free. Okay, all those things happen inside here. So that's, again, the idea of an abstract data type. So your main program, other than, than um, setting your list equal to the return value from init, your main program shouldn't change at all. You should be able to use exactly the same thing if you stuck to what I said in PA1 and made sure your main program only interacted using these things. OK, so your main program is the same as before. Um, well, there is one change to the main program, though. So the X function. Since we're allocating memory when we create nodes, I want you to free all of that memory when your program exits. So after the x command, instead of just returning, I want you to make one call to a function that you're going to write that will release all the memory. And that's, that's going to have to do some things with free. And we'll, we'll go through an algorithm for that separately. But the rest of the main's the same. So you don't need to write a new node function, because that's what malloc does. And you don't need to write a release node function, because that's what free does. And the behavior of this looks exactly like PA1. So that's, that's going to be the same experience. So however you tested PA1, you can do the same thing with PA2. So well, let's, let's talk about freeing memory at the end of the program. So when you delete a node, 
you're already calling release node in PA1, so you're just going to call free in PA2. That's not too, um, that's not very different from what you've done. But this business of when the user enters an X, you want to release all the memory. So, let's do a release all memory. And it's going to take a struct node pointer. That's the sentinel node. And the goal is to go through the whole list and free up the memory associated with each node. And you also want to free the sentinel node in this case. So this is one time you're going to actually interact with the sentinel. So how do we do this? You know how to traverse a list. Start at the sentinel, see what it points to, print out that value. Take what that points to, print out the value. Keep going until the thing that it's pointing to is null, and then you're done. Basically the same thing, but instead of printing, you're going to call free to release the node. So the pseudocode might be something like this. So set the temp to the sentinel. As long as the temp is not null, free the temp. And change temp to the next node. And go back. What? Yeah, so, so pseudocode-wise, this is fine, right? These are the steps we want to do. We want to free the memory for this node, and we want to change temp to point to the next node. But in reality, you've got to do these in the opposite order. Because once you free a node, you cannot use any of that node's fields. Once you free a node, that memory is no longer meaningful, the stuff at that memory location. So in reality, we want to move to the next node first and then free temp, but if we change temp, we can't just say free temp. So we got to do a little bit of extra housekeeping. So um, so I don't know, temp equals sentinel or list. Well, temp is not null. Um, set the old, just, just something to remember what that node was. So save that in old. Um, change temp to temp.next. And then free old. or something along those lines. So this is this is just moving from one node to the next. But before we change the value of temp, we're going to save its values to, we can pass that to free. So the effect is we change temp to point to here, and then we release the memory associated with this node. And then we'll change temp to point to the node after that, and then we'll free the memory associated with this node. So it's kind of like the previous next thing, but not as not as sophisticated. And when you get through this whole thing, when you're done, the whole set of memory should have been freed. And things go wrong sometimes when you try to free the memory of a linked list. So it takes a few tries, maybe. How would you free an array? Would you guys free the first? Free an array? Um, assuming that you allocated it with malloc, you just free the address of the array. But if you allocate it with, you know, struct node, this thing, bracket 100, there's no way to free that memory because it wasn't allocated dynamically. It was allocated basically at, at compile time.
but if you were going to do that, let's say you have integer star data, and you want this to be an array of 100 integers, you could say data equals malloc 100 times size of int. Do whatever you want with it. When you're done with that, you could just say free data. But no arrays anywhere in PA2, so. All right, I think that's all there is to say about PA2. I mean, it's, it's really the same requirements as PA1, so deliverables, exactly the same thing as before, a single tar file uploaded to Canvas, include a make file, all of your source code, put in lots of comments. How did we check that we did successfully remove all memory or free memory? So, um, dare I try the internet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have Valgrind on my machine. I can install it if if we need to. But there's a program called Valgrind, and when you run Valgrind, you say Valgrind space the name of your program. It'll run your program normally. When your program exits, Valgrind will give you a report. And it'll say how many times you allocated memory, how many bytes, um, how many times you freed memory, how many bytes, and it'll tell you if you had any memory allocated that you did not free. And it'll tell you the condition of um, such bytes. And, well, I'm already connected. because I was connected in my office. useless program doesn't really do much so haha -ha, doesn't do anything so we can say val grind haha -ha. and it runs and at the end it says heap summary in use at exit zero bytes in zero blocks total heap usage I did two allocations I did two freeze I allocated a total of 300 bytes, all right, because I did 100 in the first and 200 in the second. So here's the happy moment. All heat blocks were freed, no leaks are possible. Okay, that's good. Now if I neglect to free that second time, now when I run it, it says in use at exit 200 bytes in one blocks. Two allocates, one free, 300 bytes were alloc allocated. So leak summary definitely lost 200. So now you got a memory leak. And if I don't free that second, that first time, it'll tell me I got 300 bytes lost. And it's that easy. All right, so um, I did start looking at, at PA1 submissions, and they look really good so far. Um, one general comment. So I tried to give you very specific guidance on how to do PA1. The idea that you should never tinker with the valid flags outside of those two functions. The idea that you should never 
interact with the array directly going through each element, for example, to search or to print and things like that. If you stuck to that, right, then PA2 takes very few changes. But I've seen some submissions where people, when they wanted to search for something, they just said for i equals 1 to 100, see if the data is equal to the number, and see if the valid is equal to 1. If you did that, it will work for PA1. It will cost a few points. But you're going to have to do it a different way for PA2, because we don't have an array, and we can't search all of memory, and there's no valid flags. So if you deviated from, from those uh, instructions in PA1, PA2 will bring you back onto that path, where you're going to have to think of this as a data structure. And the only way you have to get to the elements of your list is to start with the sentinel and follow the chain of, of links. Right? And that's the goal of a linked list. So, so, so PA2 will bring you onto that path of righteousness if, if you slipped off it. Um, but barring that, Let's say that you wrote your, your list traversal or something like this. So you have a header equal to zero. That's the sentinel node's address. And we said current equals ll bracket header dot next. And then um, while current is not my null, so this is PA1, print current ll bracket current dot data current equals ll bracket current dot next okay so that that would be like a print routine for pa1 so for pa2 Header equals list, assuming list is the sentinel node pointer. Current equals header arrow next. While current is not equal to null. Print current arrow data and current equals current arrow next. So it's a one-to-one -one line for line transition from static allocation to dynamic allocation from PA1 to PA2. And really the only difference is wherever we said LL bracket something dot field, we're gonna say something arrow field. And I don't want you to just blindly go through the code and convert using this recipe, but go through and, you know, for each line, read the comment that you wrote next to it, and rewrite the line using this approach. Yeah. No, that's fine. I want it in there just so that, that you don't have a magic zero and it keeps this parallel structure, but not required. Zero is fine. So as I said before, I had one student last year, I think, who just did a global substitute in VI and got it to compile and run first try, which was pretty cool. Um, but going through and, and translating this, I'd, I'd like you to discover this, basically. Right? Go through and say, okay, I want to set this equal to the thing the Sentinel points to and write the code for it. And as you do that throughout your, your different functions, your brain will start to say, hey, <laughs> there's a pattern here, right? And that's, that's going to be helpful. That's going to sort of reinforce this idea that, that memory is just a big array. And pointers are just really indexes into that array. <coughs> All 
All right, so questions at this point on PA2, or this dynamically allocated approach. Yeah? When you type in list, what, what, what exactly would you use? So list will be a struct node star. So in, in your main program, it's, um, it's pointing to the sentinel node. And it would originally be null, but up front you're going to call init, you're going to say list equals init. And init will allocate a node, set up the data, and next fields return the address, and so list will be the address of that sentinel. And just like with PA1, that sentinel will never change its location in memory. It's always going to be at the same location. The data field we're not going to use. The next field of that sentinel may change if you insert something in the beginning. But the sentinel itself will always be in a fixed spot in memory once you initialize. And we'll talk later about how we do this without a sentinel. And without a sentinel, if you want to insert something in front of the list, your first node is going to change from, say, here to here. And we got to update, in this case, our variable list to point to this new first node. But um, with a sentinel, that's not an issue. All right, let's, um, let's write some code. I don't normally get bothered by little noises, but this is kind of bugging me. Okay. So if you're using malloc and free, you got to include standard lib.h. That's where the prototypes for those are set up. So let's make a linked list where we just keep inserting things in the beginning of the list. We're not going to sort them because that's something you got to do in PA2. But let's make a more simple structure that starts off there's a sentinel and it's null and if I say insert 10 it's gonna make a node 10 and that's gonna point to it and if I say insert 20 it's gonna make a node 20 and put that in the beginning and then if I say insert 5 it's gonna make a node 5 and put that in the beginning and so it's going to build a list kind of in reverse order of, of the order in which we insert. And we're doing that just so we don't have to go through the whole list and look for uh, the right place to insert. So let's read numbers add to the front of a list. And I'll do this without extra functions. So we'll make a sentinel node. So list equals malloc size of struct node. All right, there's our sentinel node. So data is 42, next is null. So we'll ask the user for a number, we'll call fgets. I'm going to put this in our standard CSE224 while loop while we loop until fgets returns null. So we'll keep running until we hit control D and it'll exit. We could do a forever loop, but 
it's Friday. Um, so while we get something from input, um, we'll S scan F into a num. I'm not going to bother checking the return value, so we're going to assume the user did not make a typo. Um, so we're going to need an integer num. And then we'll add to the front our number. And then we'll print our list. All right, so simple main program doesn't do anything, just calls other functions. So add to front, we'll add number to the front of the list, and print will just print out the contents of the list. And I'm doing this to, to get some code down using arrows, but also so we can build up a list and then look at it inside GDB. Okay, and that's the real, the real point here. Um, so I'll be nice and prototype our functions. So, how do we add to the front of our list? We're going to get list, which is our sentinel node, and it's going to point to something and point to something and who knows. And we want to make a new node. We want to store our number in here. So, struct node temp equals malloc size of struct node. So how do we set temp's data field to be equal to, uh, let me give these things names. So how do we set, set temp's data field equal to number to insert? Just temp arrow data. Save the integer. All right, so we've written the number in here. What else do we need to do to actually put this thing into the list right here in the beginning? Okay, so new next. We want it to point here, right? So how do we find out what this address is? It's just list next. We know that list is pointing to this current first node, so we change our new node to point to that current first node that sets up this link. And then we got one more thing we got to change. So I have list point to point to new. So that should start to feel, that should start to make you kind of happy. Because at some point, this is how our brains are actually going to think about this stuff. 
we're going to sort of see this arrow wants to point to that node and we're going to write a statement which says set that equal to that node. So temp's data is the number we're inserting. Temp next is whatever list was pointing to and list now points to temp. That should be all we need to do our insert. So traverse code. That'll be nice. I'll use a temporary. So we're going to start off with the thing that the sentinel points to. That's our first data node. So we'll set temp equal to the node that list points to. And then the same while loop that we've been doing for a while. Well, temp is not equal to null. data field. And then move down to the next node. And there's your whole traversal. Throw on a new line and we should be good to go. I knew it was going to be too good to be true. <laughs> oh, I remember you didn't have structure at the beginning. How many errors did I get for that? <coughs> 56 errors. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good because the program's only 48 lines long. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so struct node, um, integer data. Struct node next. Thank you for letting me know that. I would have like changed careers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So struct node is an int data, and it's the next field that points to a struct node. All right. So no errors there. So run this. Enter number three, four, five, seventy-seven, negative twelve. 234, and it just keeps throwing these things in the beginning of the list. Right, so this, this is doing the right thing. So let's run it in GDB. So compile with a dash G switch, right? And if you have multiple files, compile each of them with a dash G switch. And if you have a make file, put the dash G on each of your GCCs, including when you link the dot O's together. So come to GDB, say start, and I'm going to put a breakpoint at the print function just because it's convenient. So I'll say break print, and then I'll say continue. So I'll insert, um, and I'll put these in reverse order so that it actually comes out sorted. So insert 50, continue, insert 40. Yeah. So I got a three two seven six seven. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll put in a fifty, we'll put in a forty, we'll put in a thirty, we'll put in a twenty. And so now we're at we're at our print statement. Um So list is this big, horrific number. It's a memory location. If we look at what's stored at that address, it tells us, it knows it's a struct node. It's got a data field and the next field that tells us the data is 42. The next field is this other slightly different long number. <laughs> okay, that's the sentinel node we're looking at. So list has an address, and at that address we find the sentinel node. And if we print what's stored at this address, there's a 20. 
and it's, it's not going to break this out for us as a, a struct node, but we can examine this address. So there's 14 hex, that's our number 20. Okay, that's the first data node. The next location has zeros, the next location has this stuff, the next location has this stuff. So we got to do a bit of work in GDB here. Um, if we look at list as a struct node, that's the next field, that's the data field, right? So um, if we just look at list, it's this memory location ending with a 60. Let's examine that memory location. So there's a 2A, that's 32 and 10 is 42, that's the data. The next four bytes are zero. The next four bytes are this 55756B00. And the next four bytes are this 5555 five, five, five with a bunch of zeros in the front. So this struct node is actually taking 16 bytes of storage, it looks like. And if I print the size of a struct node, it tells me it's 16. And the way a struct node is set up, It needs an integer, which is four bytes. It needs a pointer, which is eight bytes. It only needs 12 bytes. But it's actually storing 16 bytes worth of stuff. So we can make a little memory picture. So this box is four bytes wide, so this is the data. This next four bytes seems to be unused. The next four bytes are the low part of the next field, and the last eight bytes are the high piece of the next field. So there's the data, there's some zeros, there's the low 32 bits of the next address, and there's the high 32 bits of the next address. And this can change from one machine to another. So you want to understand how it's storing your structure in memory, and then we can start taking apart the linked list. So let's go back to list, it's this value down here. Let's examine the four pieces. So there's the data of the first node, 20, and there's the address of the next field, 5555, five, 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 with all of that stuff. So if we go to 6AE0, which is what the next value is, we see the second node. So it's got a 1E, 16 and 14 is 30, and it points to 6AC0. So we got a 20, we got a 30. If we go to 6AC0, there's our next one. 32 and 8 is 40, and it points to 6AA0. And if we go to 6AA0, it's got 32 hex, 48 and 2 is 50, and the next field, a bunch of zeros, that's null. So you can do this as you're developing your code, and you may not need it for PA2, because PA2, I think people are gonna get pretty quickly to where it's work working. Um, but you can use this as you're developing your code and you're running it and something's not making sense. You can actually look at the structure of your list. Now in PA1, you might've had a print statement that goes through and prints every element of the array and shows you the data and the next and the valid, and you could debug like that. Um, in PA2, you do something like this. 
and it's it's almost necessarily an interactive process because again we we could just dump out the whole memory but it would be a huge dump um, so we use GDB to selectively look at different memory locations and there's there's ways you can say show me a 32-bit content show me a 64-bit contents I think we can put a long well, let me try this yeah I don't know GDB um, but there's there's a switch you can put on to show the addresses as 64-bit quantities and so on um, but this is basically how how GDB is going to help us So here's here's another program I wrote that builds a list that's not quite so pretty. Um, so the the beginning of the list is a two A, so forty two. That's the sentinel, and then the first node is at C zero. And there's a five, and that points to A zero. And there's a 10, and that points to 300. And there's a 20, and that points to uh, 2E0. And these are not sequential in memory. Okay, these are jumbled up. Um, and we don't really care. <laughs> right? Just like in PA1 in the array implementation, we don't care if our nodes are stored in the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth index successively or if they bounce around from 2 to 5 to 1 to 7 to 3 right that should never matter to your main program and in this implementation we have no reason to suspect anything about where these nodes are actually situated in memory they could be sequential they could be thousands of bytes apart they could be ordered they could be scrambled and that doesn't affect us Okay, so you really have no choice in PA2 except to follow from link to link to get from one, one node to the next to the next. So if you didn't do that in PA1, this is going to be really strange, okay, and, and you'll want to ask about it. Um, but that's pretty much all there is to say about PA2. So I suspect you're not going to have difficulty getting this to work. Um, but hop into it, give it a shot, and post questions if they come up. All right, I'll see you next time.